economy is in turmoil. Hardship and suffering. Do you see a world crying out for help? There are millions of people that believe these are signs that we are living in the final days. It is believed that our future is preordained and destined to suffer the fulfillment of ancient prophecies plagued with war, poverty, and cataclysm that will reach every corner of the earth. But is it true? Join Ronnie Cohen in the Middle East to explore one of the most fought over and historic places on earth, the land of Israel. Discover the origin of the people that occupy this land, an ancient bloodline whose history precedes the founding of the Egyptian Empire. The secrets of prophecy are revealed as it was passed down through generations, preserved and foretold to this very day. Go beyond the war on terror by understanding how ancient prophecy has dictated the culture and religious conflict that is rapidly reaching every nation on earth. A conflict that will plunge our world into ruin. Understand why millions believe that the terrifying events described within prophecy will soon be fulfilled. The beginning of the end begins with Israel in a land called Zion. Hi, my name is Ronnie Cohen. Welcome to Israel. We will talk about the different aspects of history, the wars, the occupation by different peoples, how the land was occupied by foreigners, and that still the Jews had that dream of coming back to the land, to come back to the land of Zion. There's no people in the world that can claim a city to be theirs, a capital, for over 3,000 years. But the most important thing that I'm going to be talking about, the prophecies which are told in Scripture, about what will happen. Israel, Zion, the land of Canaan and Palestine. This sliver of land which runs along the Mediterranean Sea has been called by many names. This seemingly endless span of desert and mountainous terrain has been the center of religious and political conflict throughout millennia. This small nation is home to more than five million Jews and is estimated to be a third of the global Jewish population. Against all odds, these people have transformed this once arid wasteland into a nation flowing with life, industry, and agriculture. But hidden within the ancient ruins and remnants of ageless conflict and bloodshed is a treasure beyond value that countless individuals have risked their lives to obtain. What they seek are the ancient records that contain a detailed account of past civilizations, global change, and belief systems near the birth of modern language and the origin of law. Their recorded history begins and continues long before any of the other recorded histories of the world. The Egyptians and the Mayans and uh, some of the other individual groupings of people that we often hear about as ancient. According to the Jewish record, there are none more ancient than the Jews. It spanned, of course, the Egyptian empires, and it still existed. And yet somehow they maintained this written record that was contiguous, that went all the way through for 1,600 years, even though the greatest of the empires in the world came and went during that time. How history was preserved within the ancient records is revolutionary. The records are so old that the originals are believed to have decayed into dust since parchment, which is used in the construction of scrolls, deteriorates. The ancient Jews clearly understood this and followed meticulous methods to periodically make copies of their records over the course of thousands of years. For many researchers, this brought into question the level of accuracy from the scrolls. 
one might expect a percentage of compounding errors, as the records are continually copied and passed from one generation to the next. What scholars discovered continued to separate the ancient Jewish scriptures from all other records throughout ancient history and confirmed the validity of the scrolls. The oldest Hebrew text we had was called the Masoretic Text. But then the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And the time between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic Text is a thousand years. And there are some differences, but they're very, very minor. And those minor differences do not change the actual content of that verse. Between saying he went to Jerusalem, he went unto Jerusalem. To and unto, that's how, that's how slight the variant is. But it doesn't change the meaning. The man went to Jerusalem. The Jewish scribes were meticulous in copying those things. They could not be casual about it whatsoever. They had very strict rules. They had to count every letter. They had to go to the middle letter. They had to make sure everything they did, if they made a mistake, they had to note that mistake in the margin. They had to throw the document away. And that dedication was able to provide for us an Old Testament that is right and true and very accurate as according to that which was written the first time. No other source in history, no other literature in history comes close to the accuracy of the Jewish scriptures. It's through the comparison of various discovered copies, including those made within the more modern Dead Sea Scrolls, that we realize the ancient Jewish records, regardless of age, accurately preserves the text in its most original and purest form. But it doesn't stop there. Other nations do not record their defeats. The Egyptian, the Syrian, Babylonian doesn't matter. To have a continuous records of, of successes, but not defeats and not failings. In ancient cultures, history was also recorded as a means of glorifying the kings, pharaohs, Caesars, and leaders of the day. However, the ancient Jewish records provided history with a different viewpoint. Concerning Israel's recorded history from ancient times, if you compare the, the Israel's records with records of other nations, in Jewish records, they record the successes, they record the failings. Because if they were just trying to record of uh, nationalism or patriotism, they wouldn't record their failings of their kings. They attempted to maintain consistent interpretation and unbiased accuracy, regardless of Israeli rulers, their actions or social changes. But these ancient scriptures differ in yet another extraordinary way. When I was over in Israel, one of the things that impressed me is one of the guides, as we were looking at the shrine of the book, the scroll of Isaiah, said to me, Look at this. Can you read it? I said, no, I don't read Hebrew. He said, I can. I can. He said, this is thousands of years old and I can read what this says. And that's something that the, not even the ancient Egyptians can claim. In fact, he said to me, have you ever read a 1611 King James Bible? He said, you'd be hard pressed to read the English in that. He said, but here I am, a Jew, thousands of years later, and I can read what this scroll says. The ancient language and writing that is used within these scrolls to this very day is the primary language in Israel. This would be the equivalent of modern Egypt still utilizing ancient hieroglyphics today. Most ancient languages and the means to accurately translate and interpret them are usually lost over the course of thousands of years. And yet even today, the ancient Hebrew language is perfectly intact. This is an astounding circumstance that by all means should not be possible. The uh, people of Israel, the Hebrews, uh, survived over a long period of history through various other peoples conquering them. We see the Medes, the Persians, we see the, uh, the Greeks, we see the Roman Empire. Uh, all of Jewish history charts all of these various phases of, of secular history. Against all odds, these records preceded and existed far beyond the rise and fall of countless empires, including the Assyrians, Babylonians, Greeks, Romans, ancient Egyptians, the Mayans, Aztecs, and more. Today, these records are contained in what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Torah, and the Bible. 
The original writings may be contiguous and preserved, but are the recorded events true? This is where the debate between fact or fiction is born. Scholars continued to debate archaeological evidence, and some questioned the ancient record's validity entirely. And much of archaeology is more of an art than a science. The scientific part of archaeology ends once you've uncovered what's there. If you have an inscription that tells you what it is, you've got to guess what it is. And when you have two archaeologists looking at the same thing, very few come up with the same conclusion. One of the earliest events in question dates back almost 4,000 years during a period when pharaohs ruled the world and pyramids graced the skies. Biblical records state that the ancient Jewish bloodline, also referred to as the Israelites, migrated to Egypt in 1875 BC. Later, a new pharaoh came into power and became fearful of the growing Israelite population, enslaving them by force. Based on biblical records, it's estimated that in 1446 BC, around 3400 years ago, the Israelites fled captivity, sparking conflict with Pharaoh and the Egyptian Empire. Some scholars argued that the lack of physical evidence was grounds to consider the entire story a myth, and debated whether or not the ancient Egyptians even knew of the Israelite people. Since many ancient empires, including the Egyptians, recorded their victories and often hid their defeats, it's not surprising that the physical evidence surrounding the biblical record would be lacking. But history can be a difficult thing to completely erase. The British archaeologist Flinders Petrie discovered an approximately 10-foot-tall black granite stone along the Nile called the Manepta Stella. This record was constructed 3,200 years ago to record the conflicts with the enemies of Egypt. However, what shook the very foundation of the archaeological community is that this ancient hieroglyphic record clearly mentioned Israel by name. For the first time, there was indisputable non-biblical evidence that confirms Egypt's interaction with the ancient Jews. But this discovery would prove to only be the tip of the iceberg. It's recorded that as the Israelites fled captivity, Pharaoh organized an army to pursue them. After traveling across the Sinai Desert, the Israelites finally reached the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army closing quickly. Despite various retellings of the story, the records state that a strong east wind blew throughout the night and dry land appeared from one shore to the other, allowing the Israelites to safely cross. It's recorded that Pharaoh pursued them across this exposed land bridge when the waters returned and consumed the entire Egyptian army. The Red Sea has depths up to one mile and is 221 miles across at its widest point making it virtually impossible to cross with a large group of people. As a result, many scholars doubted that it was possible for the event to have taken place, but this belief was about to change. During an expedition in Saudi Arabia, opposing the Egyptian border near the Red Sea, an ancient pillar was discovered that scholars conclude was constructed by the Israelites to memorialize the exodus from Egypt. Even with thousands of years of weathering, the Hebrew words Egypt, death, and Pharaoh can still be made out. But it was the pillar's location that brought the mystery of the Red Sea crossing into an entirely new light. Nearby diving expeditions of the seafloor revealed something that almost no one was prepared for. Spanning from one shore to the other was a submerged land bridge close enough to the surface of the sea that scholars theorize could have been exposed during a natural geological event or change in tide. Some divers even claim to have photographed remnants of ancient coralized chariot wheels and human bones littered across the submerged land bridge. To understand the devastating effects that scholars are only now researching, 
we look to the tragic Indonesia tsunami of 2004. The world witnessed how shallow, rushing water claimed the lives of nearly 230,000 people in a matter of hours. Even if Pharaoh's army moved hastily over this exposed land bridge, it would still have taken them at least an hour to travel from one side to the other. With the similarities between the events, we clearly see how Pharaoh's army, likely being miles from shore, could not have survived. For some time, many critics have determined that that was just biblical folklore. But as time progresses, archaeology continually discovers more and more evidence that the Bible is right and the Bible is true. Stories including those of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was said these cities existed during a time of great immorality in the ancient world and were utterly destroyed by fire and brimstone. They have discovered uh, pockets of uh, land that has been seriously charred. They don't know exactly what happened with that, but in the Bible it says it rained down fire and brimstone upon that place and burned the place up. And there are areas that they have discovered charred ruins and uh, with, with the smell of sulfur, burnt sulfur. In fact, archaeologists have discovered human remains for over one and a half million people in the area in which Sodom and Gomorrah was believed to be located. Surprisingly, the geological contents of the area confirms the biblical story of its demise. Archaeologists have discovered depths of four to 20 inches of sulfur and ash mixed within the surface soil and within deeper layers of earth that surround the sites. As scholars begin to consider the ramifications of these discoveries, the question remains, how could this event have happened? Parallel to these cities is a fault line where two large plates of earth are continually exerting great pressure. Combined with recently discovered underground sulfur pockets in the region, researchers are considering the possibility of how combining tectonic activity along with highly ignitable natural deposits could have indeed sparked the unprecedented explosion that brought an end to millions of people. First of all, if you look at the evidences for the written record as being uh, from a broad scale, stand back with a big wide angle lens. When something is described in the biblical written record, you can sink a shovel into the ground somewhere and dig it up. You'll find where it was because the written record is accurate. It's ge geographically accurate. Uh, it's even geologically accurate. Sometimes things will be explained about rocks or rock formations. Not in any scientific detail, but enough for you to know that it happened on the east side of the Jordan rather than the west side. The rocks on the east side of the Jordan, for instance, are black. They're white on, a, on, on the west side of the Jordan. Uh, certain details as far as where certain things took place, suddenly an archaeologist digs something up. And you can physically see here the destruction of the temple. You can see how the walls were knocked down by the Romans. You can see how this bridge was destroyed and made in the fact, street collapse. In fact, well over 100 biblical cities and sites, with tens of thousands of artifacts and tablets referring to individuals and kings, including ancient Israeli ruler King David, have been and continue to be discovered in many countries, including Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, and Israel. An artifact that was found in the city of Dan, which is way up to the north, it used to be called Laish, which happens to have a, it's a plaque uh, written in an ancient language that pronounces a curse on the house of David. But it predates um, the New Testament and the, uh, the Hasmonean dynasty uh, by centuries as it goes way back towards the time of David. Uh, when they found that artifact, when the archaeologists who were beginning the restoration project on Tel Dan, the mound of the city of Dan, they accidentally ran across this thing, and when they pulled it out, they found the first written evidence of the name of David outside of the Bible itself. Up until then, of course, many people had said that it was all a legend, that David wasn't even a real person, he was a person of myth. As far as archaeological support for Old Testament history, you're actually quite a bit. You have the inscription found at um, Tel Dan that mentions the house of David. 
You have also the um, writings um, of the Assyrian that mentions the house of Amri. You have um, you have the Sumerian the Sumerian Astraka, which uh, Astraka they found from the time that Sumer was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. You have the Gezer calendar from Tel Gezer, which tells you about each two months is a new thing growing, and so on. So you have a lot of Old Testament uh, history verified by archaeological evidence. It seems there is no end to the evidence. Remnants for countless biblical events, including the burning peak of Mount Sinai, have been discovered and photographed by archaeologists, and to this very day contains charred earth and stones. The location that was recorded to provide the Israelites with water as the leader Moses struck a rock in the desert is also believed to have been discovered. The archaeological site is surrounded by a bed of smooth rocks not ingenious to the area, concluding that a massive water flow from an underground river was present, emerging onto the surface through a large nearby split boulder. Artifacts that confirm the location of cities, kings, wars, global disasters, and events perfectly matching ancient biblical records are being uncovered with each passing year. As again, as far as actual historical archaeological evidence, scientifically verified evidence, nothing's been found that would discredit the Bible in any single way. Not a single thing. Everything points to the conclusion that the events described within the biblical record are equally as accurate and reliable as the process is utilized to preserve the record itself by the ancient Jews thousands of years ago. With tens of thousands of discoveries, why then do educational institutions and scholars continue to dispute the validity of the Bible? The answer may be the result of yet another aspect woven throughout all the writings the belief that God exists and directly influences events within the world. The escape from Egypt, the Red Sea crossing, the burning peak of Mount Sinai, and countless other events that took place are recorded as occurring not strictly from chance or geological changes, but rather through the direct intervention from God in association with preceding prophecies for these events throughout history. It seems that in light of the overwhelming evidence of the Bible being true, being an accurate historical record of things that have taken place, it poses the question as to why do secular archaeologists so still continue to fight against the fact that the Bible is accurate. The only answer that I can come up with that is that the Bible is a record of the Jewish people, but it is also the Word of God. And to take God out of the, the picture, you remove the miraculous. To take God out of the picture, you remove the all-knowing aspect of a God who knows everything. And if you do that and you don't believe in that God, well, then obviously you can't believe in anything that is beyond your own imagination, beyond your own reasoning capacity. But the fact that God is in the picture in the Bible is the greatest archaeological evidence of all because the miraculous things that were taking place, the things that he's done, the accuracy of the scriptures, all testify to something that could not be done by man. In fact, the timeline of the scriptures being written over so many different authors, over such a long period of time, and all knit and woven together, is a testimony not of just the Jewish historical record, but of the God they believed in. The existence of God and prophecy. That's what this conflict is really about. The fundamental reason why some scholars and educational institutes are adamantly resistant to discussing biblical history and archaeological findings in a literal and supportive manner. The, uh, the attitude uh, when I was set in the archaeology classes at university, if it's in the Bible, it can't be true. But uh, that's where they're coming from. And so you got a lot of these attacks, but um, you got to realize where they're coming from. And they don't have the actual evidence, scientific evidence, archaeological scientific evidence, that this proves anything in the Bible. What they have is certain theories that they want to prove. But you have to remember they're coming from a, a certain preconception, and they work with that preconception. 
After all, if there was some truth to the existence of God and the ability to foresee the future through prophecy, then prophetic events regarding our own frightening future yet to occur could be true as well, a belief that many rationalists reject. There are several different schools of thought concerning the, uh, the information that's brought forward, the, the archaeological evidence that's found, whether it's New Testament or Old Testament. Uh, schools of thought that are along Christian lines or even Judaic lines. Other schools of thought that are along rationalist lines. The documentary hypothesis or higher criticism that dismisses the miraculous as being um, uh, anything that's rational, therefore the miraculous can't exist because it, it opposes rationality. Uh, God speaking to people also is not rational, so that will be dismissed in that particular camp. Based on that, the, the belief that miracles do not happen, that God does not speak to people, when they dig up an archaeological artifact that, that appears to be biblical, they will look at it through an entirely different lens. But if you ask someone, and there are many people to ask, many very good people, but if you ask them, why? Why, why would you do that? And they would simply say, because it's not rational. But is there another explanation? No, the argument ends right there. Why then haven't some scholars simply ignored the aspect of God and prophecy within the records, as what many often do with other ancient findings from the Egyptians, Mayans, and so on? Why not focus strictly on the archaeological evidence? Not all the books may have. Most of them don't have prophecy. Some of them may have. But you can pull those prophecies out. It doesn't destroy the book. You take the prophecy out of the Bible, the Bible is destroyed. You cannot remove the prophecies from the Bible and maintain the Bible. Same thing with miracles. There may be miracles in other books, holy books. You, you can take those miracles out and the book is fine because they're not germane. You take the miracles out of the Bible, the Bible is destroyed. They cannot survive if those stories are not true. So could the prophecies be true? It's undeniable that many prophetic records were sometimes written hundreds of years before a specific event. In these cases, even for skeptical scholars, it's difficult to deny that many of the prophetic fulfillments took place. But it's often argued that the fulfillments were the result of chance and not of God. Is it true? Could the fulfillment of biblical prophecy be the result of chance, as some claim? Or is there a truth presented within the ancient scriptures that could change our perception of reality forever? To understand the nature of prophecy, we must look to the land of Israel during a time that many might say is a period of prophetic writings and fulfillments unlike any other period in human history. During the time when Jesus Christ walked the earth. Around the year 30 AD, Israel, after fleeing Egypt, had now been long established as a prosperous and growing nation for over 1400 years. It was at this time that Jesus of Nazareth was in the land. He provided messages of hope and life, but he also provided many detailed prophecies regarding the future of not only the Jews and Israel, but of the entire world. The reaction to Jesus' prophecies was interesting. They didn't know what to make of them. They were confounded by them, in fact. And as usual, the disciples, not really understanding where Jesus was heading with much of his terminology, even though it was very understandable, he spoke on a level that peasants could understand. One prophecy in particular was directed to the nation of Israel. As Jesus was in Jerusalem, he prophesied that the holy temple in the city, the most revered structure in the entire nation, would be utterly destroyed and that no two stones would lay upon another. Not unlike expected reactions today, many people were believed to be greatly angered by this warning. Some of the people that, that would not have believed the prophecy, in fact, were greatly angered by it, would have been members of the Sanhedrin, uh, namely the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. Uh, their anger is very, very evident about such things. Look at this 
huge temple complex, 35 acres, the temple itself being 160 feet tall. Uh, the whole outside of the, the complex itself, uh, as Josephus described it, looking like a mountain of snow, colonnaded on all sides by 60-foot high columns, built like a massive fortress. And they look at this and they say, well, what do you mean not one of these stones is going to end up upon another? It, they were incredulous. In fact, along with the destruction of the Jews' holy temple, Jesus foretold that the nation of Israel would fall and the people would be scattered to the ends of the earth. Which indicates in that prophecy that Israel will have been so utterly obliterated in history at some point in their future history that it would seem like they could never possibly live again. 37 years later, the prophecy was fulfilled in the greatest of detail. Pompey came into this area the Roman general, and so the significance of where we are right now, that land bridge between two mighty empires, Mesopotamia and Egypt, the crossroads of civilization. It was a trade route that connected three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And later on, that trade route was well known to be one of the most important trade routes in the world, the Via Maris. People then knew that if you controlled this trade route, you controlled commerce. And if you controlled commerce, you controlled money. And if you had money, you had power. In the year 68, during the holidays, actually Passover, many of the Jewish believers from around the world who came to pray and pay homage and come to visit the temple were actually stuck inside the walls when the Romans began to besiege it. The Romans built a siege wall around the city so no one will escape. The fighting in Jerusalem lasted for two years. In August of the year 70, the Romans managed to breach the walls. They destroyed the temple, burning it down to its foundation. Over a million people died trying to defend the city of Jerusalem. And if you go to the Temple Mount now, you can look down from the original Temple Mount where those stones that Jesus predicted would be thrown down, are all laying down on the original pavement, the original layer, the street where Jesus actually walked. Every detail of the prophecy came to pass just as Jesus foretold. Additional prophetic details found in the ancient book of Ezekiel, recorded long before the fall of Israel in 70 AD, describes Israel as becoming so utterly destroyed the future state of the nation is described as a valley of dry bones, a nation that will be dead to the world. But the prophecy continues. Israel would be later brought back to life, and the surviving Jews within the world would be regathered into their land. Seemingly optimistic scripture that was recorded even before the fall of Israel took place, and yet rationalism would suggest that this ancient prophecy could never be fulfilled. Nowhere else in history were a people who were scattered, disassembled, removed from their nation, assimilated into multitudes of other nations on the face of the earth, were ever gathered back together once again in their original land and established as a recognized nation in the world. But after 1800 years, the impossible happened. On May 14, 1948, after the Holocaust and the end of World War II, the nation of Israel was reborn and the Jewish people once again had a land to call home. The action was ordered by the United Nations. It was the first and only time the UN had created a state by way of a General Assembly vote. Israel coming back as a nation to me is the most astonishing event in history. And there's a lot of astonishing events in history, but it's never happened before. It's never happened in the history of civilization that a nation could be completely dispersed and 1,800 years later come back together as a nation with its original national identity. This has never happened in the history of the world. But the prophecy continued even further. Within multiple ancient books and scrolls written before the fall of Israel in 70 A.D., 
It was foretold that Israel's rebirth would be followed by conflict and war with many surrounding nations. This time, however, it's written that Israel would not fall to those that seek destruction of the new nation. As the world witnessed the prophetic fulfillment through the rebirth of Israel on May 14, 1948, the following prophecy was fulfilled only a few hours later. On the evening of May 14, 1948, the Jews declared their independence. Seven Arab nations attacked. In a matter of hours, Israel's first modern war had begun. Several Arab nations, including Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, invaded. Israel survived. But the next attack would prove to be a different story. More support from the Arab world would mount to destroy Israel. In the early spring of 1967, it was eminent that the Arab forces once again were determined to throw the Jews into the sea. Even Radio Damascus were making broadcasts in Hebrew, telling about how they're going to do this deed, to throw the Jews, finally, into the sea. The Egyptian forces were massing in the Sinai. The area which was now being controlled by the UN forces in the Gaza Strip were told to leave by the Egyptians, so they left. King Hussein was forming his artillery just over here on the Mount of Olives. The Egyptian Navy had already cut off the Straits of Tehran, stopping all shipping from Elat going to the Far East, which in a way is an act of war, an act of piracy. The world did nothing. The Syrians were waiting upon the Golan Heights, still shooting down into the valleys, the town of Tiberias along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. The rumors of war are imminent. At any day now, a war was about to begin. Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser was a key component for the invasion with a force of 1,000 tanks and 100,000 soldiers that were poised and ready to destroy Israel. They tried to wipe out the Jewish people because, see, if he could wipe out the Jewish people, then he would make God a liar because God says in Ezekiel 36 that he would regather the people into the nation. And it says in Isaiah 66 that can a nation be born in a day? So he knew that this nation would revive. The bones, the, the, the dry bones would come back in, into the land and become fruitful again. Israel was surrounded on three sides by invading forces, which outnumbered and outgunned its own defenses. The attacks were relentless. However, through unprecedented events on every battlefront, the Arab invaders became disorganized and quickly began losing their strategic advantages. Within six days of fighting, the Israeli forces pushed out the Jordanian forces through Samaria, Judea, out of Jerusalem and across the Jordan River. They pushed back the Egyptian forces, not just through the Sinai, but across the Suez Canal. And up here on top of the Golan Heights, they didn't just push back the Syrian forces from the crest of the Golan Heights, but they moved them back 15 miles to the east. But Israel did not fight a war to capture land. They fought a defensive war. Even by 1968, a year after the war was finished, they sent a message through the Arab League that was meeting in Khartoum in the Sudan. And they said to the Arab League, listen, we did not fight a war to take land. Let's exchange land for peace. But it's well documented that the Arab League refused to trade land for peace. And once again, plans to destroy Israel commenced. In 1973, these same nations would make their most aggressive attempt yet to destroy Israel. But this time, they would strike on the Jews' most holy national day, Yom Kippur. The Yom Kippur War was so savage against Israel. Uh, the sneak attack, which uh, was launched by uh, both Syria and Egypt, attacking from from uh, the north and from the south and trying to split Israel in two and then again drive them into the sea was being, uh, it, was, it was savagely effective in, in wiping them out. And suddenly, one little event after another turned around and Israel was able to push them back and not only push them back, but push them back so far that by the time the war was declared at an end by the United Nations and intervention from the United States, 
Israel was within 10 miles of Damascus and 10 miles of Cairo with no armies in between to protect either of those cities. They could have gone right in and taken both those countries. It was only because of Henry Kissinger stepping in saying, if you don't stop now, the Russians are going to land with 850,000 troops and we're going to be in the midst of World War III. And Israel stopped and the world didn't go to war. The fact that Israel survived that attack is absolutely phenomenal. The odds against them were tremendous. The forces that came against them were much better trained than in the Six Day War. The planning was much better. The odds against them, uh, man per man, tank per tank, plane per plane, were like 10 to one in many cases. And yet, they're still in existence today. They were not driven into the sea. And that was completely miraculous as far as I'm concerned. Militarily, they did not stand a chance. Through rational deduction, Israel should not be standing today. For a good part of the last 60 years, this tiny nation has been outnumbered, outgunned, and surrounded. And though conflicts with neighboring nations and Islamic extremists continue to this day, prophecy seems, at least for now, to have been fulfilled. The destruction and rebirth of Israel, survival against all odds, no doubt amazing events that some would say are stranger than fiction. But did it all happen by chance? If you only have one or two or three prophecies, you might be fulfilled by chance. That's a possibility. When you have uh, just the first kind of prophecies alone, about 50 specific prophecies, and so these prophecies are like uh, 15 verses long, like Isaiah 52, 53, even to fulfill every detail of that chapter purely by chance or by coincidence, to me is an impossibility. The prophecies that were fulfilled in the Old Testament over time in history, if we were to assign that to chance, it would make fools of us all. Because the statistical probability is something that uh, is used in everyday life. But when you talk about a statistic, a statistical probability perhaps of, of a, a city that is declared a wicked city and therefore judgment is going to fall on that city, and now here's how it's going to fall, that it's going to be attacked by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, that it's going to be utterly wiped out and yet survive being wiped out. It's going to be attacked again by many nations and it will be ultimately completely destroyed and on the site fishermen will spread their nets. Well that's much more specific than saying the city's going to be wiped out someday. And then you find out that this prophecy is given when Babylon was just a little hick town as part of the Assyrian Empire in the south. And suddenly it grows up and a guy named Nebuchadnezzar comes along and he does attack the city. And he does wipe it out, but the people relocate to an island off the coast. And then suddenly uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who doesn't have a uh, navy, after six years of siege, backs off. Along comes Alexander over a hundred years later. And he tells them to surrender. But he doesn't get any cooperation because the people are on an island. So he takes the debris, scrapes the whole site clean and throws it into the ocean creates a causeway a half a mile out to the island and then gets on a whole fleet of little fishing boats, sends his soldiers across and kills every last man, woman, and child on the island. Now, that's very, very specific. And considering that the prophecy in the documents that we have in the Bible says that this is the way it would happen, and then history plays it out, not all at once, but over a series of hundreds of years. How do you explain that? How do you put numbers to that and say, this was a coincidence? There are other prophecies in the Old Testament, for instance, in the book of Daniel, where we can't call them coincidence. In Daniel, uh, one chapter alone has over 130 specific prophecies about nations and people, about invasions and wars, uh, specific characters and intrigue. The 130 prophecies that Daniel mentioned came to pass exactly. We can look at it throughout history, that during that time in that region we can name names. Uh, a phenomenal, phenomenal amount of detail. But again, the rational mind doesn't want to accept that. But Daniel did write it, 
He was quoted many times between the time that he wrote it and the time when all of those prophecies were fulfilled and quoted by other nations that surrounded Israel, not Israel itself, which is very convenient to have other people quoting his works. And then at the end of it all, it all came to pass. Much of biblical prophecy is presented in a chronological fashion and builds one prophetic event upon another, often presenting a string of future events before the first event even occurs. We see this same pattern with the writing that pertains to the fall, rebirth, and modern conflicts of Israel. If only one prophetic piece of the puzzle doesn't come to pass, then the entire series of events would fall apart. Well, looking at all of the things that we've spoken about regarding the Jewish literature and the events that have been prophesied and fulfilled, it boggles the mind, boggles my mind to think that these things happened by chance or by coincidence. The fact that God would thousands of years ago pick a people, that these people would be scattered throughout the entire world for a couple of thousand years and that these people would be back in a nation, that in and of itself is a phenomenal, phenomenal event, and the odds of that taking place are, are beyond reason. Today, it would be hard to imagine what our world might be like economically, politically, and religiously in only a few decades. And yet ancient prophecy has foretold detailed events extended thousands of years into the future with unprecedented accuracy. Regardless, some scholars continue to argue that these events are not prophecies inspired by God, but are rather the fulfillments of astronomical odds. Astronomical odds. The odds would be absolutely astronomical. When you look at the way these prophecies of the Bible come together, one on top of the other, you have only two alternatives. It's either to embrace the fact that they claim they are from God and it must be true, or that I can't believe that and I have to believe in absolutely improbable odds. Approximately 2,500 prophecies exist within the ancient scriptures, each chronologically built upon the previous. It is estimated that two-thirds of the scriptures have now come to pass. If the fulfillment of these foreseen changes and events were provided by a higher source, then it would suggest that the remaining one-third of the prophecies will also come to pass. The remaining records take place during a period called the Last Days, a time foretold by Jesus Christ and recorded by over a dozen authors within the ancient scriptures. It's a time that dictates monumental change involving every nation throughout the world. These final prophecies provide hundreds of details and specific events foretelling of an unprecedented union of world relations, beliefs, and economic systems that will give rise to a new authority with influence over all global affairs. But as soon as the world achieves this new union and declares peace and safety, mankind will be on the brink of war an unprecedented destruction that is foretold to end two-thirds of the global population. But if this terrifying string of future events is to come to pass, when does it begin? Or has it already? According to the ancient prophetic timeline, it was foretold that the rebirth of Israel, witnessed by the world only six decades ago, would mark the beginning of the end, and all remaining prophecy would come to pass within a generation. As a result, hundreds of millions of people around the world believe our generation will now witness the conclusion of prophecy. Could they be right? Has the groundwork for a globally united world described within the scriptures already begun? The Bible clearly teaches us there'll someday be a, uh, a global unity, eventually a one world government, a one world uh, empire, a one world economy, a one world religion. All of these would be unified into a one world system. If these prophecies are true, there'll be radical changes, much more radical than the world has ever experienced before. You have the predictions that the world will move towards a globalized government. 
it doesn't mean that the world will be one specific kingdom, but one homogenous kingdom, a kingdom made up of, of all kinds of nations that cooperate together. As the scriptures portray, the last days will not bring in a new single global nation as many imagine, but rather a new homogenous world with superseding global authorities and laws, an unprecedented ideology that has already begun. The world certainly seems to be headed towards globalization. The various different countries and groups and personalities seem to be working to come together in some way, shape, or form. We have whole sections of the earth that are now being united. We've seen what has happened in the European Union, the joining of the nations over there into one group. They do have someone who exercises authority. They have a, they have a court system that crosses over into the various countries and overrules and has a superior authority over the various countries, something I never thought I'd ever see in my lifetime. 27 of some of the world's most influential countries, including Germany, France, and Spain, are now part of what the world recognizes as the European Union. Rather than being defined as a new single nation, these governments rather act as one and have maintained their borders, individual identities, and languages. What makes this union such an unprecedented change in political relations was the birth of a new authority, court system, and shared financial system that supersedes each individual nation, a concept that only a generation ago was unimaginable. But why is this trend in globalization occurring? Prophecy foretells that this new world will not be one enforced upon the people, but rather it would be demanded by them. Prophecies foretell that the world will believe this is the solution to establish peace and harmony. We see these things beginning to take place. And the book of Revelation in, in chapter 13 lays out that these things would take place in the end times. So what we're seeing is the preparation for these things. Politically, politically the world is starting to agree we need to become one. We need to be united. It'll solve all of our problems. However, according to the scriptures, this globalization will not solve the world's problems. The early stages of globalization has been creating a world in which nations and cultures can no longer ignore one another, and that in itself has helped to create an environment of increased conflict between fundamental ideologies and belief systems. Prophecy clearly states that during this early period of globalization, there will be widespread wars and rumors of war, and that peace will be removed from the earth. Much of what this prophecy foretells can be seen within the radical conflicts that have evolved into global terrorism and the constant threat of attack. It is a modern issue that now affects nearly every region on earth. In order for there to have, uh, or there to be political unity on the face of the earth, one of the things that divides from a world's perspective is the fact that there are so many religions on the face of the earth. Even within Christianity, we see multiple divisions from different types of Christianity. If there, if there was going to be one political system, that system must find some way of uniting those various religions. There has to be an attitude of acceptance and tolerance and finding common ground in all of the religions that everybody could basically ascribe to, and then they could form that one world religion and they would be able to promote the unity politically that they want. The terrorism that we see that is based in religious ideology today would prevent any type of political unity in the world. Something has to take place where the ideologies have to come into one frame of mind. If we look at the terrorism that is in the world today, it is fracturing the world. It is threatening various bases of political authority. And until that is dealt with, you will never have political unity because the ideologies religiously of the people 
take precedent over their political aspects and their persuasions. So from the world's perspective, the solution to terrorism is to unite the religions. If they could unite the religions on common ground, then the terrorists are eliminated. Today, a majority of the world's leaders seem to agree in order to have true political peace, we must unite the world's cultures and in effect find commonality among the world's fundamental belief systems. We see today many, even within the church, those who profess to be Christians, we see many different kinds of denominations now wanting to be together with other kinds of religions in the world. We see the Catholic Church trying to unite many different kinds of religions and having a common prayer service together. And so we see many of the religions of the world trying to get along. We call it the ecumenical community. And that's just part of what the Bible says that will be coming in the last days. Just as prophecy foretells, during the last days, we see this rapidly progressing into a commonality that is being accepted across the globe. It is an unprecedented belief that many paths can lead to God through the elimination of an absolute truth. On a global scale, there's a new way of thinking about religion. Um, it's, it's a relativistic way, if I could use a kind of an intimidating word, of looking at people's belief system. It's also the most foolish thing that you could ever imagine if you really sit and think about it. It's based on the premise that what you believe is fine as long as you're sincere about it and as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. And people raise up their own belief systems within themselves and they say, well, this is what I want to believe and you believe what you want to believe and I'll believe what I want to believe, which means that nobody's belief is right. It's all our own making. We are our own little gods making our own little religions. It's not hard to see the, the move to consolidate religions even within the Christian religion. There are many factions of Christianity that have become extremely tolerant of other views, to embrace other thoughts, other religions, to bring in Eastern ideas and, 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 and even some occult ideas into the church, and that there are many, many ways to get to God. The notion that it all comes down to personal choice is really opening the door for acceptance of basically anything or any type of religious thought at all. By accepting them all, they embrace none, and so consequently there will be a uniting in the sense that no one is against anyone, or no one is truth. There is no absolute. But if the result is peace, and that everyone appears content, then what's the problem? If everybody's happy with this one world religion, what could possibly be wrong with it? It's not based on truth. First of all, it's not true. If every man believes what he wants to believe, he cannot call it uh, truth because when he dies, his truth dies with him. That means it was never true in the first place. He was his own god of his own false religion. Regardless of one's belief system, it can hardly be argued that the modern consolidation of beliefs is occurring on an unprecedented scale. And yet, all of this is simply another piece to the prophetic timeline that is rapidly leading to the emergence of a new world. The move towards global unity is vastly believed by the world to bring about a new age of peace and security, the cornerstones for protecting our modern way of life. But what is the real purpose to it all? Is it really to bring about global equality or establish peace? Or does it really come down to what's most important to the people of this world? money. When it comes down to it, everything is controlled and revolves around the world's financial systems. Food, medical care, transportation, shelter, technological advancement and entertainment. A collapse in these systems would result in the loss of the quality of life so many have become accustomed to. But the foundation and the financial structures of the world have been cracking for quite some time and nations are beginning to take notice. 
The final piece laying the groundwork for the prophetic globalization puzzle is financial unification. Just as the world has been unionizing politically and religiously, it is inevitable that the world will eventually be unified through a single world currency. Where it would be much easier to come in and if there's a collapse happening in a, in a confederacy of nations, then someone can come in and say, hey, we can help you out. Given the circumstances of the world today, this may be the only solution to prevent events such as the U.S. housing crash of October 2008 that quickly affected nearly every industry on Earth, triggering a global recession and damaging some of the world's most dominant currencies. We have begun to realize just how intertwined and fragile our global financial systems truly are. As long as we live under the current economic structure, the world lives under the threat of future global economic depression or even collapse. The move towards global financial control is, is already happening in various areas. In the European Union, as they've established a one currency between the nations, I've seen this in my lifetime. I was over in Germany in the military, you know, for 18 months, and there was the mark. In France, there was the franc. Various countries, they had their individual currencies. Now that has happened there. If you would have told me that 40 years ago, I'd have said, you're crazy. It's never going to take place. But we have seen regional globalization of finances. What currency we will end up with, I truly do not know. But it may be the euro. It may be something from some other worldwide source. It might be a new currency that no one's ever heard about that will indeed be the worldwide currency. Don't think it could ever happen. It's already begun. At a recent G8 summit in Italy, the leaders of the world discussed the growing concern over global financial security and openly discussed drastic new ideas to create financial stability. It was during this summit that the idea of a global currency was officially born. This is the first minted prototype that was presented to and discussed by the leaders of the world at the G8 summit, including Barack Obama of the United States and the President of the European Union. For the first time in history, the world's most influential nations have come together to recognize, discuss, and embrace the possibility of establishing a single worldwide currency to secure and control global financial markets. In fact, this coin was also presented to the Pope of the Catholic Church by representatives of the Royal Canadian Mint, seemingly foreshadowing the future foretold by prophecy and the unification between politics, religion, and finance. The world is rapidly becoming more accepting of this new global ideology like never before. In theory, global financial control should result in global financial security. So the illusion is that global financial uh, control will give global financial stability. But I don't believe that, that that is the case because once that takes place, you have a central control and you will be able to, that central control will be able to manipulate the finances of the entire world. And I don't believe that there's anybody on the face of the earth who can do that with a pure heart, with, a, with good intentions and without greed factoring in because those things have been part of mankind for a very, very long time. This is not to say that the currency presented at the G8 summit will by any means become the new worldwide currency. However, the event presents an unprecedented shift in global thinking among world leaders and financial institutions. The remaining prophecies within the scriptures are specific in regards to the state of the world in the last days. Prophecy doesn't simply foretell of political, religious, and financial changes over time, but that it would be the simultaneous convergence of all scenarios that would clearly mark the beginning of the end. The convergence of the events prophesied would create a global scenario that has never existed before. When you consider that thousands of years ago, the condition, the state that the world would be in, that we can see today, the globalization of nations, the push towards a 
one religion. The, the need, it seems now, for a single economy through the world. All of these things were prophesied in the scriptures. And the odds of those things taking place over time, over multiple nations, over many different historical events, I don't even think can be calculated. According to the prophetic timeline, man indeed believes that globalization is the solution to our problems. With the political, religious, and financial fronts united in the future, the world no longer segregated by culture or borders will be primed to embrace the rise of a new world authority. It's written that the newly found unions of the world will not only welcome this new authority, they will demand it. There will be a one world leader. It doesn't necessarily mean king of the world, but somebody who comes along who is able to capture the world's attention and hold it. A person who is so charismatic that people will say, we don't care what his agenda is, we just like him. We will follow him. He will make proposals and uh, make political alliances that today we think are impossible. At first, he's coming because the people in the world want him to come. They want things to change. They want a better economy. Throughout the scriptures, this man is referred to by more than 20 names, but there's one name in particular that you may recognize him by the most. That one person the Bible speaks about is called the Antichrist. But when we say Antichrist, of course, Hollywood has really latched onto this. They love to depict him in movies like The Omen or End of Days or something like that. And yet, as you read about this person in the Bible, is someone who will be so charismatic that he will captivate the world. They will call him uh, the greatest leader that has ever lived. I think believers who understand Bible prophecy might recognize him as he's rising to power, but, well, but the unbelieving world probably won't. They'll probably see him as a savior. In fact, prophecy speaks of new peace treaties established by this man with Israel and other nations of the world. Though there will be peace, it will be only for a short time. But according to prophecy, when the world finally announces peace and safety, sudden destruction will be upon us. It's foretold that Israel will then reject the global union. The new world authority, influenced by the Antichrist, will quickly turn hostile towards Israel. And we can see where Israel has become uh, sort of a, a sore spot in the world, even today, even before this one world ruler comes on the scene. The whole world seems to be divided up in one way or other over Israel. Should they be a nation or should they not be a nation? Many are coming against Israel. Many hearts and minds are turning against Israel. Many people in the world today, many nations in the world today, look at Israel as the problem of what's going on over there. Israel during this time will be standing in the face and against everything that this Antichrist wants to do. At some time, the world is going to come against Israel. This is prophesied in the Word of God. We see that in Ezekiel, and we see that in the book of Revelation. They're gonna come against Israel and try to completely destroy it. Just as the fall of Israel was prophesied in 70 AD, history will repeat itself in the last days, and Israel will be at war with the world. One of the things um, that we look at is Ezekiel 38. And the prophet Ezekiel wrote thousands of years ago, okay? Uh, Ezekiel 38 um, tells of the nations that are gonna come against Israel in the last days. So all those first four names that are listed in Ezekiel 38 is all in the area of, is, is Russia. And then it says after that, that they're gonna come with Persia. And we know that that's Iran. I think it was in the 30s that Persia's, uh, 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 our name was changed to Iran. Uh, their government has been switched to a radical Islamic terrorist government who is calling for the destruction of Israel. And then Libya. We haven't heard from Libya uh, for 25 years. He's been silent until just recently, over the last year, they signed a billion, billions of dollars arms agreement with Russia. 
Once again, this will be a war for Israel's very existence. But this is a war they cannot win. The forces of the north will come down along with other forces in the region and they will come against Israel. And there is no way Israel will be able to defend itself against these forces. The forces that come against Israel will be the greatest accumulated force the world will have ever seen. Israel once again will face extinction. That major battle that will happen in the valley of Armageddon to the north where the armies of the north will be coming down, sweeping down over the hills of Judea and into the area of Samaria. The remnants of the Jews will escape. They'll go to a city of Haven. Many people believe it to be Petra. Bible seems to indicate they run off to a place called Selah, which has another name in the Bible, uh, in history actually, called Petra, which is really quite possibly the world's most defensible land position. Many scholars believe that Petra could have been constructed by an ancient king of Israel for the purpose of protecting the nation during the last days. It has sat dormant for thousands of years, waiting to fulfill its prophetic role. During this period of war and chaos, Jesus Christ also foretells of natural catastrophic events that will reach every corner of the earth. In the book of Revelation, it speaks about this time of tribulation. And it describes in more detail what Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24. It would be a time of devastation, of tribulation, like the world has never seen before. It speaks about earthquakes and famines and wars. It speaks about huge numbers of the population of the earth being wiped out by these things. A third, a fourth, over and over again, the population of the earth is whittled down uh, during this time. And what's interesting is uh, over the course of the disastrous things that take place, the people of that time do not turn their hearts back to God. Throughout this short period of tribulation, there will be global war, financial collapse, disease, earthquakes, floods, and earth changes unlike anything ever witnessed before. Every nation upon the earth will suffer and billions will die. But if the events occurring today are setting the stage for this inevitable future, then why do so many reject what so many others see clearly? Now, having examined what the scriptures say about events past, prophetically, and that which is happening currently to align with the things that the Word of God says, the question has to come to mind, why doesn't everyone see this? Why are so many going along as if there was no information available about this at all? Well, it has to come down to the fact that if you do not believe in a God who is able to foretell what is to come, if you don't believe in a God who has shown himself to be faithful, in the scriptures to so many things if you don't believe the scientific statistical information that displays that these things are genuine they are true the odds of them happening by chance are too great then you should be able to embrace what it says you should be able to have a view of the world according to what the scriptures say, but the scriptures say something else. It says during the last days, there would be a great deception that is released upon the world. There would be a blindness to many and the eyes of the people of the world will not be able to see the things in, even though they're right in front of their, their faces, literally. So what this comes down to is that in order to see and understand what the Bible says, requires a person to believe in the one who gave us the Bible. If you reject him, there is a blindness to that. You're looking for all kinds of other things, other ways, other ideas. But if our world is watched over by the God from the ancient scriptures, why would he allow the world to suffer, to be destroyed? 
The events prophesied are not derived from God's hatred of the world. For it is written that God loves the people of the world, but is rather the inevitable outcome created through the actions of our own heart's desire and free will. The prophecies of the scriptures must come to pass as man's heart has not and will not change. The prophecies of the Bible, to me, make the Bible the Bible. So much of the Bible is prophetic, and so much of those prophecies are regarding the future. So many of them were made so long ago and have come to pass in the finest detail. But if the prophecies of the past came true, I can't imagine that the prophecies of our future that are made in the Bible won't come true. They must, and they must in the finest detail. If the prophecies of the Bible are not from a divine source, then the remaining events foretold in the scriptures will never come to pass, and our world will progress to one of an infinite number of unpredictable futures. But if the world remains on the path to prophetic fulfillment, it means that the source of the scriptures are indeed divine, and Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. Then his promise woven throughout the ancient scriptures is true, the promise of eternal life for those that follow him. So having uh, discussed all of these various prophecies and the veracity of the Word of God and the statistics and the things that are to come, it still comes down to a choice that each and every person is going to have to make. Now in order to make that choice, you can believe what you hear or you can seek for yourself. If you really want to know what is true, you can seek it and the Lord will reveal it to you. Your time within this world is passing away, and every day you are making a choice. A choice to seek the truth or reject it. A choice to pursue eternal life, or the choice to pass away with the world you love so much. Thank you.